Welcome to the Holiness Today podcast. On today's episode, listen to H. Ray Dunning give a series of lectures on the Apostles' Creed. This is part one of two and includes an introduction to the Creed on Christ and on the work of Christ. This was originally produced for the Layman's Tape Club in 1982 and was reformatted for a podcast episode. Essential characteristics of Christianity. First, it is an experience to be received. Second, it is a life to be lived. And third, it is a creed to be believed. Christian people tend to gravitate toward one or the other of these and make it the whole of the faith. Some are strong on experience, but lay minimal emphasis on ethics or beliefs. There are some who make Christianity little more than a way of life, and there are some intellectuals who reduce it to simply believing certain doctrines. Dr. Chapman was right in insisting on a balance among these elements. All of them are important for the fully developed Christian life. His position in this booklet was that the creedal or belief aspect of Christianity was embodied in the Apostles' Creed. It embodies the common elements which tie all Christians together. Perhaps I should note to begin with that the title does not mean that the creed was written by the apostles. It is rather intended to suggest that the creed embodies the basic teachings of the apostles who are the authoritative eyewitnesses of the historical events that constitute the heart of the Christian gospel. Because of these considerations, I thought that an introductory study of the Apostles' Creed would make an appropriate beginning the next time your pastor asks you to turn to the reading in the back of your hymn book to recite the Creed, and I hope he does that often, hopefully you will read it with a greater depth of understanding than before. Notice first that the Creed is divided into three articles corresponding to the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. All the ancient creeds reflected this structure. While the doctrine of the Trinity is a great mystery, which ultimately exceeds the capacity of the finite mind to comprehend, it is the most distinctive of Christian doctrines. It is not a problem added to other doctrines to make life difficult, neither is it logical nonsense. Rather, it reflects the Christian conviction that God has made himself known to man, and this disclosure has a threefold aspect. He unveils himself as Father, as Son, and as Spirit. But these are all manifestations of one undivided God. Dr. David H. C. Reed puts it in a simple but satisfying way. We experience God as always and everywhere. That's the Father. We experience him as there and then, that's the Son, and we experience him as here and now, that's the Holy Spirit. Persons who insist on reducing everything to completely rational terms have traditionally had trouble with the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. The Unitarians, for instance, reject it by denying the deity of Son and Spirit. Modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses reject it on the basis of common sense. And certain contemporary Pentecostal sects deny it by teaching a Unitarianism of the Son, a Jesus-only idea. All these stand outside the boundary of historic Orthodox Christianity, which affirms as central to its belief about God that he is triune in his self-revelation. The first article affirms briefly, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. This is not, in the first place, a declaration against atheism. While belief in God is doubtless the most fundamental assertion of faith, it does not involve a theoretical belief as over against possible unbelief. God's existence is assumed, but never demonstrated in biblical faith. He is the most real element in man's religious consciousness. The important question concerns the nature of the God with which we have to do. In its historical setting, this first article declares the unity of the God of creation and the God of redemption. 
Early efforts had been made by some thinkers to solve certain intellectual problems by teaching that there were two gods. There was an inferior deity who brought the world into being, who was the God of the Jews, about which the Old Testament speaks. And then there was the God and Father of Jesus Christ, the high God of whom the New Testament speaks, who seeks man in salvation as a God of love. But early Christians vigorously rejected this division and insisted on one God who is both creator and redeemer. Thus implicitly, they were holding that the Old Testament was a valid part of the Christian Bible and witnesses to the same God who manifested himself in Jesus Christ. Many Christians today, for all practical purposes, have rejected the Old Testament by relegating it to an inferior role in their study and reading. Perhaps one reason for this is that they, like these early people, have difficulty reconciling some of the pictures drawn there of God with the picture of him they see in the teachings of Jesus. This is really a too, e too easy way out, which the church has resisted from the beginning. What we need to do is to work at discovering the proper way to interpret the Old Testament. Perhaps the most unique feature of this first article of the Creed is the joining together of the predicates Almighty and Father in speaking of the character of God. One speaks of ability and power, the other speaks of love. They condition each other. The God who is Almighty is the Father. The Father who loves is the Almighty One. This connecting together speaks eloquently of the Christian's understanding of God. When we speak of power, we commonly think of God's omnipotence and enjoy speculating about the possibilities of that power. But the Creed cautions us at this point to keep in mind that the possibilities of the Christian God are the possibilities of love. God can do anything that love can do. Another way to say the same thing is that God's power is not a characterless power. This precludes all those mind-boggling, childish questions that sometimes arise when we try to make sense out of naked power, such as, can God bring it about that twice two equals five? Or, can God create a stone so big that he can't roll it away? As the great theologian Karl Barth said, the power of God is the power of his free love in Jesus Christ, activated and revealed in him. This affirmation in the Father Almighty is a declaration of faith in the face of all evidence to the contrary. When evil seems to prevail, we are tempted to abandon one or the other, to either question God's love or his capacity to do something about the problem. But to faith, since the God of creation, the Almighty One, and the God of redemption, the Father, are the same, we have confidence that in love he is in charge and is working out his purposes in our lives. We know this most surely because of what we learn of God in his self-revelation in Jesus Christ. That points us on to the second article of the Creed. To it, we will return in our next lecture. In this time together, we are continuing to look at the Apostles' Creed as the classic summary of Christian doctrine. In our last visit, we noted that the creed had a threefold structure reflecting the doctrine of the Trinity. And we spoke of the first article which declares, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We saw that the most striking feature of this statement is the joining together of the terms Father and Almighty, thus uniting the Old Testament and New Testament as witnesses to one and the same God, and further declaring that the God of power is the God of love. We observe that this unique combination is most clearly made known to us in Jesus Christ, which leads us to the second article of the Creed. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. In those words, the early church is seeking to give expression of its belief about the Lord Jesus. There are so many ideas that come to expression here that we will be unable to explore all of them. What we will try to do is look at a few of the basic affirmations. Running like a thread throughout the whole statement is the repeated emphasis upon the full humanity of Jesus. It was important to affirm that he was a man. While that may seem obvious to us, the facts are that the church has found it difficult to make this point stick. Perhaps it was more difficult in the early days than now. In that time, there was a teaching that held that to be material was to be evil, since matter was sinful in essence. Many Christians apparently adopted this way of thinking. As a result, they taught that Jesus did not possess a human body, but was a ghost. When he ate and drank, many of them said, it was only a charade to deceive onlookers into thinking that he was real. This position was unacceptable to the mainstream Christians, and the Apostles' Creed seems to have as one of its purposes the refutation of this idea. It is at this point that the first article of the creed contributes something to the discussion. It affirms that God created the world with the implication that if God, who is good, made the material world, it too is good. Thus the doctrine of creation stood as a bulwark against this dehumanizing teaching about Jesus. From our vantage point, we find the views about matter being evil to be easily rejected. But is it also true that we find it easy to accept the full humanity of Jesus? I sometimes encounter people who talk about Jesus in such a way as to lead me to suspect that maybe they are having trouble holding on to his humanness. We conservatives are more prone to do this than more liberal Christians. They seem to find it easy to lose his deity, but in holding on to his deity we often let go of the other. The other side of the picture is emphasized by the words conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, as well as the title, Our Lord. While Jesus was fully human, he was also fully divine, having been with God through all eternity. These two sides to Jesus' person stand in paradoxical relation to each other. By this I mean that we cannot fully explain how they can be conjoined in one undivided person. Jesus was not a psychological monstrosity, a split personality, yet the complete explanation of how this union could occur remains a great mystery, ultimately exceeding human categories. But the early church experienced him in both dimensions and refused to let go of either. We should guard against that trap as well. The book of Hebrews would be a good study here. Read through the entire book, marking those verses that stress both the deity and the humanity of Jesus. You will find some of the most exalted passages in Scripture concerning his divine origin and nature, and at the same time, some that speak with great eloquence about his full humanness. They just about balance each other out. That reflects what Christian doctrine has consistently tried to do, maintain both his full deity and his full humanity. The doctrine with which we are dealing here is technically known as the incarnation. It is taken from the Greek word meaning flesh and could be roughly rendered as enfleshment. The Son of God becomes flesh, taking upon himself the full form of man. This is so important to Christian belief that St. John in his first letter stated that anyone who denied that Jesus had come in the flesh was of the spirit of Antichrist. Well, you say, what does that have to do with me? 
That question would probably take hours to fully answer, but let me just call your attention to one result which the Hebrew letter mentions. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus' temptations were real because he was like us in every respect, sin apart. Therefore, says the Hebrew writer, he is able to give support to those who are tested, understanding and help. These are two benefits we derive from the incarnation, and there are many more. I am looking forward to talking with you again about these matters. There are many more. I am looking forward to talking with you again about these matters. In our ongoing discussion about the doctrinal teaching embodied in the Apostles' Creed, we are continuing to explore the second article. In our introductory Christian doctrine course, I asked the students to memorize the Creed. That would not be a bad exercise for me to suggest to you. Obviously, I cannot require it, but maybe I can stimulate you to do it on your own initiative. Why don't you begin by trying to repeat with me the second article which we are working on in this segment of the tape. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Last time we focused on the Incarnation or what Christian thinkers often call the doctrine of the person of Christ. But this statement also speaks about what we may call the work of Christ. One of my assignments is to serve on the Board of Orders and Relations of the district where I live. It is an interesting assignment. As we examine candidates for the ministry, I usually get to ask the doctrinal questions and one question I like to ask goes something like this. If I were a layman on a church board interviewing you as a prospective pastor, one of the most important things I would want to know is if you understood what the gospel is. Tell me, what is the gospel? I get some fascinating responses. But the correct answer is embodied here in this creed and is found primarily in the words suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. The word gospel, as you know, means good news. One other member of the board asked me once if I wouldn't just accept that for an answer. My answer was, certainly not. When the nurse brought me the word that my wife had delivered a son and that both mother and son were doing well, that was good news, but it was not the gospel. No, the gospel is the good news that God has invaded and acted in history one more time in the person of his son, and that event makes possible a salvation from sin. Sometimes people want to include in the gospel a collection of abstract teachings, or even further from the point, a group of ethical rules. But what we are seeing here is the biblical point of view at work. Look, for instance, at the confession of faith in the Old Testament, such as Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 9. What you find there is the reciting of the story of God's activity in the history of the Hebrew people. The same thing is true with the New Testament preaching. 
such as we find in the book of Acts. It, too, recites the history of the mighty acts of God, but climaxes the story by speaking of God as engaging in history in his last and greatest act. And this last and greatest act is the coming into human history in the person of his Son. Listen to the words of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, as he summarizes the gospel. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. The words of the Creed, like the words of the Scripture, are lacking in flair. A few pointed words capture the essence of what it was all about. Really, there are two words which can provide the focal points for the total work of Christ. The word suffered, and the word judge from the last phrase. These two terms point to the twofold character of the work of Christ. At his first coming, he appeared as the suffering servant who makes salvation available to all men through his death. At his second coming, he will return to judge all men based on the way they have responded to him in his sacrificial acts. These two events constitute the boundaries of the Christian era, and the time in between, in New Testament language, is called the last days, the time between the times. The Swiss biblical scholar Oscar Kuhlmann has suggested a striking analogy to explain the significance and relation of the two happenings. He compares the first to D-Day, the time when the Allied forces landed on the Normandy beachhead. From that time, the outcome of the war was not in doubt, although there remained a long mopping-up process. By this analogy, we can say that in the Christ event, God established a beachhead in human history. In his death, Jesus took on in mortal combat and defeated the powers of evil. As a result of this decisive victory at the cross, Satan's final loss in the struggle was guaranteed. However, D-Day awaited V-Day time of the final consummation. In like manner, the triumph Jesus won at the cross is to be demonstrated at his second advent. At his first coming, his kingdom was inaugurated at the second coming it will be consummated. Jesus' return in glory as the judge is one of the cardinal tenets of Christian doctrine. However, it is seen in the New Testament as the ultimate outcome of something that has already happened. I have a greeting which I have fallen into the habit of using when I run into someone I see on a fairly regular basis. It is, what's the good word? A friend responded to me the other day by saying, Jesus is coming again. I think he was a bit surprised when I remained silent. But you see, I was thinking about the fact that the really good word is that Jesus has already come. And in his suffering and death, he has assured the final establishment of his kingdom. His return will be to receive the scepter he has already won in the time of his humiliation. Thank you for listening to the Holiness Today podcast. If you enjoyed this production and wish to hear more, visit holinesstoday.org slash podcast or find us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts.